All right, cool. Um, all right, can you guys hear me? All right, uh, everything seems to be working. Um, all right, I don't know what's yes, happening. I can. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, all right, it's still saying I'm unable to take camera. I apologize about that, Something just it's just not working. All right, so at least I can see you. <laughs> okay, cool. So to recap where we were, elephants, um, elephants have this intrinsic role in nature, which they shape and change environments. Now, one of the important things that people don't realize is that elephants act like bulldozers and they create microhabitats because they go through the bush, smashing up areas that were historically very, very densely packed with a lot of thorny vegetation. And by having a herd of elephants move through those areas, you remove a lot of that vegetation and you create small, what we call a mosaic of habitats in a, in a, in a habitat in an area. And that mosaic can actually create opportunities for different types of wildlife. Um, likewise, what elephants also do is because they tend to be quite heavy, very aggressive browsers. I know the word aggressive doesn't seem to apply with browsers, but it does. <laughs> They're very aggressive browsers and they break down trees into a much smaller size. They keep them more bushy and that allows feeding for smaller animals like kudus, inyala, bushbuck, that sort of thing. Whereas if you tend to have fewer elephants in areas, you get this wonderful tree canopy forming, which is great for birds, great for mumbi, uh, monkeys, great for black mumps or green mumbers, but not very good for a lot of other browsers and grazers. So if you're looking for a more woodland habitat, you would, you would want to have fewer elephants. If you're looking for a more bush felt, bushy, scrubby habitat, which actually supports a hell of a lot of, of browsers and grazers, that's where elephants come into the equation. And I've worked on many reserves where you can see where elephants are going and where elephants aren't going. And the areas that they are going tend to look like they've been hit by a nuclear bomb. So they tend to be very, very, very damaged. Uh, for those of you that are just joining, I apologize, guys. My camera is not working. Um, it was working earlier. It's just refusing to cooperate now. So to give you a recap, I don't know what the story is. Um, but hopefully it will upload the camera when I upload the video. Otherwise, we'll just have a, an audio conversation. Now, um, there was an interesting study done in Salvo Nature Reserve in the 1970s um, on elephant population growth. And elephant population growth in Salvo was unchecked, it was uncontrolled. And now this is not me condoning culling before we go into this. Now, elephants bred out of control in the area and actually denuded all the vegetation. They ate literally everything on the reserve. And it led to the death of about 5,000 elephants. So, because they starved to death, never mind everything else that starved to death in that reserve as well. And that was in Salvo in the 1970s. Um, so, elephants don't have this wonderful, magical approach to controlling themselves. They don't have this intrinsic link with nature. And they just know how to get things right. They are as bombastic and as disinterested in, in conservation as humans are, to be quite honest. And um, they can make or break a habitat depending on their populations. And we tend to have this magical mindset about elephants. They have these whimsical, charming, magical creatures that, that have this perfect place in nature and they just understand and they have this wisdom. And that's absolute bollocks, to be quite blunt. Um, they're an animal. They're a very intelligent animal, but then so is your dog. Um, and uh, so is my cat um, and they're very intelligent and um, they have an understanding of what they're doing in terms of how to facilitate their lifestyle. But they don't, they certainly don't um, plan their environment and they don't plan their, their, um, their role in nature. So elephants tend to, um, to have this misunderstood mindset or this misunderstanding around them where people seem to think that elephants maintain themselves and they'll just grow uncontrolled until eventually something environmental steps in. Like in Salvo in the 1970s, they starved to death. That's literally what, what happened. And um, you often hear on reserves now that we're taking non-violent methods to, to control elephant population growth. And people say, oh, how can you do that? They just want to breed. But unfortunately, we can't control uh, the amount of um, breeding that these animals do because they breed like us. They just keep breeding until they run out of food. And with humans, we can design new technologies, we can redistribute populations, we can educate communities, we can do all that. But unfortunately with elephants, we can't. So um, 
in South Africa, we're reaching a, a, an interesting predicament. While elephant numbers are declining worldwide, on private game reserves and on government game reserves, they're kind of peaked. There's, there's no more growth for elephants in South Africa. And um, some reserves can handle a couple more, but the, the vast majority of reserves in South Africa are their maximum carrying capacity. And because of the pressure by tourism and by the pressure by well-intentioned but misinformed people, there's this ever-growing need to increase elephant numbers on reserves. Oh, just keep having more. I mean, in the res in the Kruger National, they said that there's, I think they said that, that even if they remove 600 elephants, they would still be overpopulated. So we, we have this passion and this love for elephants. Of course, we want to protect every single one. And um, I've even seen drives in Botswana when they go out and they try to actually feed all the elephants that are starving and give them water. And in many ways, they're actually just adding to the problem when you do that kind of thing, because the elephants themselves, they're not able to control their population growth, much like we can't. As I said, they're not magical. They don't have this inherent link to nature like everything else or not like, or like uh, anything in nature. It, they just continue to breed. And what controls them is their own environment that they get to out of control eventually they run out of food and they starve to death which controls their numbers so it's not a very romantic approach to to understanding elephant conservation but um we need to be realists and then we want to expand elephant populations we need to um look about expanding habitat and um that's where the big crux is in south africa now and conservation the biggest challenge is not getting elephants to breed they breed really really um, I don't know, Frankie, can you hear me? Um, Frankie's asking if she's the only one without sound. Um, everyone else seems to be hearing me just fine as far as I can tell. Um, yeah, um, so the biggest problem we have in South Africa is not breeding of elephants. In fact, in Southern Africa, we don't have a problem with breeding of elephants. We have a problem of, um, of, of space. That's the biggest problem. Um, Kara saying I'm breaking up a bit. Let me try and switch to another line. Uh, that should be better. Okay. And um, I'll talk slowly so make sure people can hear me. And guys, again, if you've got any questions, please ask. Because again, some of the slides, I can't show them because it's not showing any slides. I don't know why. Um, so again, I haven't done workshops for six months, so I'm a bit behind the technicalities of it all. But yeah, um, so conservation is the biggest thing. And we are trying to develop habitats for elephants because every reserve that has got elephants is chock-a-block, they're full. So the next step is as conservationists, either as amateur or professional, is it's our job to find new space for elephants, you know, new land. And I went down the South Coast the other day in KZN down to... Um, or be gorge. And there's a significant amount of areas there that are nature reserves, but they're not big five. And you've got to ask yourself to say like, why are we not pushing for communities to expand their reserves to becoming big five? A lot of them will be three, 4,000 hectares like Oraby Gorge, but it doesn't have, maybe with the exception of leopards, it certainly doesn't facilitate endangered animals. Um, they're, they're not contributing to, to meta populations of elephants and that sort of stuff. The Eastern Cape has got quite a few small reserves that are scattered through, but KZN's reserves, we don't need more reserves. We, need, we don't need bigger, bigger reserves. We need more reserves over larger areas. So the South coast of KZN, we need more high felt reserves. We need to be spreading populations out because at the moment, what we're getting is we're getting these highly, 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 um, dense populations of, of elephants in different reserves and in other areas they're completely denuded like you'll have reserves all throughout northern KwaZulu Natal then you've got 2,000 kilometers of nothing and then you get to the eastern Cape or 1,000 kilometers of nothing not 2,000 and then all of a sudden you have elephants again and they are not really contributing to a meta population program and the reason why I talk about meta populations is because when you have to transfer elephants from one area to another area. You can't just take an elephant from KwaZulu-Natal and smack them in the Eastern Cape and expect them to survive. They're not adapted to their habitat. They don't know the food. They don't know the culture of the elephants in that area. Yes, elephants have a culture, uh, much like humans do, much like dogs do. They have a mindset. And um, by bringing it, there was, I can't remember who it was, one of my friends, I think it was um, 
someone was mentioning to me that they brought an elephant down from from um, Tembe Elephant Park and they smacked them in an Addo Elephant Park. And of course, this big bull had no idea what was going on because he was taken a thousand kilometers out of his comfort zone, smacked into a brand new reserve where he knew nothing about it. And he starved to death, unfortunately. He died very slowly and very badly. And what we need to be doing is for elephant populations to actually survive is to create lots of smaller reserves that have not necessarily huge herds of elephants, but smaller populations of elephants. Because elephants are able to communicate with each other over fairly long distances, up to 50 kilometers in certain circumstances. They're able to um, pr produce these vibrations through their rumbling. I'm sure you guys have all heard about elephant rumbles. Those are not their stomachs rumbling. That's actually a pharyngeal pouch in their throat, which produces vibrations. And it's just like Morse code. So they have a language that they can speak. And in different parts of the world, if you go to Kenya, they will speak a different language to the elephants in South Africa. They communicate slightly differently. The vibrations are different. So it's effectively a different language. Now, these elephants are able to communicate with each other over fairly long distances, theoretically up to 50 kilometers. So if you're having meta populations every dozen, every, every couple hundred kilometers, populations of animals will hopefully be able to communicate with each other and they will have a more holistic mindset because we've often found in reserves that elephants that break out, they make their way straight away to a reserve with other elephants because they can actually hear them communicating with each other. So they make their way to those reserves. And um, having big gigantic gaps between populations of elephants creates you know, tensions that we actually aren't even aware about because this elephant might be put in a brand new reserve, but historically elephants are used to hearing elephants all around them. You know, they'll hear them over the hill, they'll hear them across the lake, you know, and they'll be able to communicate with each other even passively. And all of a sudden you, you create a new reserve in the middle of nowhere, 20,000 hectares. The nearest elephant population is 300 kilometers away, but all of a sudden we're expecting this newly introduced herd of elephants to just acclimatize and settle down and be okay because um, they, they won't be able to smell any other elephants in the area. They won't be able to hear any other elephants in the area. And I think our focus on having these big, giant 20,000 hectare reserves, although it's great in terms of carrying capacity, it doesn't help elephants in terms of metapopulations. And there's been a lot of studies on, in terms of, of elephant health, like elephants in the Kruger area, for example, because lots of communities of elephants are able to communicate with each other, they tend to be less stressed in KZN elephants. There's been a lot of studies with this and they've shown that the very isolated KZN elephants tend to be very stressed because they are not interconnecting with any other herds or communities of elephants. And um, we obviously as laymen, as average, average Joes who don't really have a say in government, we don't really have much power in terms of that. But uh, what we do hopefully have is some influence that we can encourage people in the future to set up smaller reserves more frequently across the country, rather than these big, massive reserves every 200 kilometers. And of course, that starts to step on toes of tourism, because if you had to introduce a, a reserve 50 kilometers away from Durban, everyone up the coast from Durban is going to be up the coast towards Mpangeni, towards uh, Pongola, and Shishlui is going to have a heart attack, because you say, oh, you're stepping on our tourism toes. So that is um, Mercedes, you raised a hand. Sorry, you're asking a question? No, sorry. It just, yeah, no, no. Yeah, you're having a very bad reception. I don't know why it comes and it goes. I don't know if everybody got the same problem. Okay, let me try this. Uh, is that better? Can you hear me now? Mercedes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Is that better? Okay, I just switched signals again. So I don't know. I think we, we because of the rain and the signals are a bit bad. I think so, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that, guys. If you can't hear me. No, it's I'll, okay. I'll upload the video again. Um, does anyone have any questions before I go forward? No, no questions. Okay. Um, all right. So, but going back to where I was with conservation is that we need to start looking at creating smaller habitats, smaller reserves. And I think that communities um, of farm owners and whoever can, they can actually step up and say, we're going to start introducing smaller reserves across the country would, would, would be a far bigger benefit to elephant conservation than in these big I mean, 20,000 hectare reserves with a hundred elephants on it. That's not actually helping. Also what happens is, is that with 
elephant reserves is that these areas with really big populations start to denude the populations of plants. And they're not necessarily starving the elephants out, but actually affecting plant diversity in the reserves. A lot of the reserves that I've worked at with both Asian and African elephants, um, uh, Kara is asking, why would smaller reserves be more beneficial? Kara, because it, it allows for genetic diversity and um, it also allows for meta population. So when you are transferring elephants from one reserve to another reserve, it's healthier for that elephant to take an elephant from a reserve 50 to 100 kilometers away than to take an elephant from 1,000 kilometers away. As I was saying earlier, they took an elephant from Tembe Elephant Park in northern KwaZulu-Natal, transferred him down to Addo Elephant Park in the Eastern Cape. He stopped eating. He didn't communicate with the other elephants, and he starved to death. Uh, because he was completely out of his comfort zone and he didn't understand anything and he was completely alienated from elephants that he understood and a language that he that, that he was able to communicate in and and um, he was not there he was basically robbed of all of his identity so having small reserves frequently dotting the country will create a meta population of elephants 20 here five there 20 here and it's far more effective for them genetically to be transferred and also for themselves to communicate with each other elephants from ndumo and tembe earthen park they communicate with each other all the time even though they're not able to reach reach with each other they've shown that they communicate backwards and forwards elephants from private game reserves are communicating with elephants in shishui uh, game reserves Reserve. So these big giant gaps between big giant reserves isn't healthy. We should rather be focusing on having smaller reserves. And even if it does step in some tourism toes, we need to figure a way around that. Um, maybe having private concessions and that sort of thing. Um, another thing is that elephants have been taken out of areas that historically they had a very important ecological role. And um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But going back to plants, what I was mentioning earlier is that elephants are like humans. They take the nicest things out of the environment. They, um, we, we tend to think that, um, you know, that they are very selective, but actually they're very fussy and they like the nice stuff. They'll take all the very rare, very in interesting species, usually the, some of the more important keystone species in the environment, eat those and leave the rubbish behind. Leave the sickle bush and the acacias and the guaris and all the stuff that nothing else really wants to eat. They'll leave that behind and only start eating that when they eat all the nice stuff. If you go into a reserve with elephants, I challenge you to find a cabbage tree. I challenge you to find an aloe. I challenge you to find any soft herbaceous member of the pea family uh, because they they eat them all and they're gone. And then they'll start going for the, the very slow growing, very palatable trees like um, combretums. And they'll start going for sausage trees. And they'll start going for a variety of very palatable species. And um, it's like going to the buffet and they take all the prawns and they leave you with all the mashed potatoes. <laughs> so, um, and this is one of the big problems with, um, with having too many elephants in a reserve is that it starts to affect your plant diversity, which also starts to affect the diversity of other animals because they'll go and wipe out all the variety of vegetation on a reserve, leaving behind two or three species that do very well, like sicklebush and guari. And um, they will, they'll take everything that's actually really nutritious out of the environment and all of the other animals are left to eat are sicklebush and, and guari. And um, they unfortunately are not going to be the best browsing vegetation. So you start seeing a lot of your browsers taking a knock when you start to have too many elephants in an area. They do create habitat, but at the same time, they also destroy opportunities. So again, this is why I'm saying having small numbers of elephants dispersed across the country rather than these big giant reserves that are saturated with elephants. Um, every reserve in South Africa, as I said, is done. They, they cannot have any more. So if you see them having babies, they're actually creating a problem for themselves. Um, in Kruger National, they've got a species of palm tree that's critically endangered, and they've actually had to electrify those areas because the elephants are eating all those palm trees, and they're also eating all the cycads. So, um, you know, elephants, again, coming back to it, aren't these perfect, magical creatures that just understand nature. They're, they're intelligent like us, and with their intelligence, they tend to be a bit selfish, and they use it to their maximum advantage. Um, and um, we... They actually have not got that much time. We've only got another 20 minutes. So um, are the TFC areas helping at all? Yes, they are. But um, the TFCA, um, and they are definitely helping, but we certainly need to have more private reserves. And um, there needs to be a push to drop fences between reserves. 
as well. And the reason for this is because I've encountered, especially in KwaZulu-Natal, which is where a lot of my background is, is that elephant pop, elephant reserves, when I say elephant reserves, I mean big five reserves tend to be segregated. There tends to be lots of 8,000 hectare reserves all bordering each other with no fences, with fences in between them. Now, that's all well and good for keeping animals on your land and make sure that your animals are your animals and they don't intermix. The first problem is, of course, genetics, because within two to three generations, you're going to start having cousins breeding with cousins, and you don't want that. You want your populations to mix up. Um, and that's something that we're seeing in South Africa all the time, is that um, we're getting a lot of inbreeding with elephants. You're getting you know, fathers mating with daughters, and you're getting cousins mating with each other. And that's what's happening with, with um, these reserves where the elephant populations are not able to, to, to move around. So the one issue is creating small, smaller reserves. The next issue is when we've got smaller reserves, if they border each other, we actually ideally need to push landowners to drop fences. And again, that becomes a land ownership issue. But um, it's something that we need to tackle in terms of conservation efforts. And um, it's better in the Kruger National Area because most of the private concessions have dropped fences in the Kruger. So their populations are able to move around, which is creating much healthier populations. But uh, in KZN, most of our elephant populations are very isolated. They are unable to move. Uh, and they're all, boxed in, in, they're all boxed in in smaller reserves all in northern Zululand. If you go past, if you go past of the, the Tugela River, there's just no elephant reserves. And um, we really need to rethink the way that we spread our populations around. There's hundreds and hundreds of little micro reserves all boxed together in northern Zululand all the fences between them and none of them are able to intermix their, their, their populations. So we need to, in some way, create opportunities for these elephants to start dispersing. And the way they used to do this was literally taking bull from reserve to reserve and mixing the bulls around to introduce new genes. But much like humans, you can't just dart a human being and uh, drop him in a reserve that he knows nothing about or in, in, a, in a village he knows nothing about and expect him to start mating with the locals. So you can't just say, here's a German, off you go, go to Iceland or go to, go to, 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 to Mongolia, just start hooking up with the locals. It's not going to work. So elephants need to be familiar with an environment that they actually understand. That's why, again, having smaller reserves across the country will facilitate that. Um, one of the biggest issues that we have in South Africa lately is with the growing tourism we have in South Africa, pressure on elephants and tourism is immense. There's this perpetual need for people to be up close and personal with them. And it's one thing if you've built a relationship with elephants, but we've got almost, I would say, the only word I could say is a toxic mindset to big five tourism where every tourist runs out and has to chase the big five. And um, oh, it's extremely costly. Yes, it is costly. Um, there's this perpetual mindset to chase the big five and everyone's got to see the big five in every drive. And when you get elephants, you have to get as close as possible. And uh, stress is a major impact on elephant ecology. One of the biggest reasons we're seeing reduced fertility in elephants, while we're seeing more miscarriages, while we're seeing more hostility amongst elephant populations, while more males are killing each other, is because they're being antagonized by tourists. And us as conservationists, as guides, be it nature guides or cultural guides, we need to understand that impact and we need to change the way that we chase elephants. Uh, you know, if you've got a good relationship with a certain population of elephants and they approach you and they come up to you, that's one thing. But, you know, there's this mindset with elephants that, that they've learned, oh, don't mess with humans because humans will shoot you if you give them crap. So they behave themselves around us, like in, in the Kruger National, that these, these bulls and these females, they they tow the line because they know that they, they get into trouble with us. They don't tow the line, but eventually they get pushed into a corner and they explode. And of course, it's always, you know, the elephant gets shot because oh, he was a problem bull. There's no such thing as a problem bull, just like there's no such thing as a problem child. It's just a child that has issues. And uh, there's usually a reason for those issues, be it abuse, be it harassment, be these sorts of things. And you often find that elephants that are, have been perpetually harassed by tourists have the strongest levels of aggression, you know, uh, and the highest levels of stress. Uh, I was working with um, Elephant, Re uh, Re Elephant Reintegration Trust, ERT, uh, with uh, Tammy Engling, and she was talking about um, this, the, she goes out and she actually measures the hormonal levels in the, in the dung of elephants 
because they were looking specifically at how the elephants were responding to tourism. And they show that even with the best intentions of the places with the best intentions, the most holistic mindsets, or what they perceive to be the most holistic mindsets, those animals are being antagonized. Much like if you had a household and you were doing your daily chores, you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're doing your job, you were gymming, and along come tourists every single day into your home and take photos of you in your kitchen. Doesn't matter how nice they are or how nice and friendly you are or how well intentioned those tourists are, you're going to get antagonized. Um, so we really need to, to, to put less emphasis on elephant tourism. I mean, it's a major drive in South Africa, but, um, it's becoming, it's becoming toxic and, um, not in one or two reserves, but throughout South Africa is a big five tourism is a toxic industry. Um, it, it puts guests, need, guests wants first over animal health and animal welfare. And we really need to, um, to, to, to rethink the way we do tourism. And one of the benefits of doing smaller reserves across the country is uh, that the fact that tourists, tourists in general would have a greater opportunity to visit a variety of reserves. And economically, that would be an issue because these reserves will not be receiving the big amounts of cash that one reserve was receiving. Uh, you would now have trickles of income coming into lots of small reserves rather than slushes of income coming into one big reserve. Uh, so economically, I could see the, the, the issue with that. But in terms of animal health and animal welfare, it would be more beneficial to have populations of elephants that are visited intermittently. Um, and the only way you could do that is by having reserves that are effectively cycled around where the animal's health is taken to concern and their welfare is taken to concern. And then you'll see a decrease in the number of females that are having miscarriages. You'll see a decrease in the number of males that are killing each other, a decrease in the number of vehicles being flipped and the, a decrease in the number of attacks at lodges. I mean, I hear issues all the time with elephants attacking staff at lodges and it's not the animal's fault. The animal's already antagonized because he's perpetually having his button pushed by guides and by staff. And um, we really we blame the animal and say, oh, he's a problem animal. He's a bull and must. And yeah, bulls and must are bulls and must. But just because he's having a hormonal imbalance or hormonal fluctuations doesn't mean that he hasn't got opinions or attitudes that he's built up already around them. I mean, if you just like you talk about a pregnant woman, a pregnant woman's aggressive and she's grumpy because she's pregnant. But, you know, the, if she's pissed off with you, it's not she's going to be irrationally pissed off with you. It's probably because you forgot to do something or because you did do something wrong. And so the fact that she's pregnant has made it worse. So, so um, we really should be rethinking the way that we do um, our elephant tourism in particular, and not just elephants, but big five, but elephants especially because they are so prone to stress. And uh, when I was in Sri Lanka working with the Asian elephants, I saw the exact same problems where mothers and, and aunts would huddle around the young and protect the young from vehicles. And we think they're just bonding and they're being nice. But the mother is traumatized and the calf is traumatized and the mother is protecting the calf from the vehicles. And the tourists think they're just having a whale of the time. And um, it's, you know, it's one of those things where we, even as guides, we've been taught you know, these are the things you should and shouldn't do, but we really need to reevaluate just our ethics regarding guiding in general and that chase of the dollar. And that's really made guiding a, a, a toxic culture in this country uh, in many ways. And I know I'll, I'll piss off a lot of people by saying that, but I'm, I really don't care who I piss off, to be quite honest. <laughs> I think people that know me know, know I'll say that. Um, but yeah, guys, uh, we've got like 10 minutes left. So if you guys want to throw questions in there, please do. Uh, you can type them or you can take your microphone of mute and we can chat. Any questions? Anything? Nothing. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep talking. All right. Uh, there's no questions. That's fine. I'm just going to keep talking. I like the sound of my own voice. Um, so, but, so what we're looking to do, I'm going to plan to do another elephant workshop in the future with a bit more detail now when my graphics are actually working. Um, and we'll get into some more technicalities about the actual, um, the must cycles. Does anyone here not know what must is? I'm going to type it in, M-U-S-T-H. If you don't, just please send a message. Uh, uh, hold on. Everyone in the meeting must. Does everyone know what that is? If you don't, um, please speak now or forever hold your peace. So must cycles are, if you don't know, I'll explain that. They are a hormonal cycle in elephant bulls 
that change with the seasons, typically around the rainy season. And it's when their testosterone levels increase up to eight times its normal level. They become hypersexualized and hyperaggressive. And um, the older the bull gets, the longer their must cycle gets. So bulls that are in their 30s and 40s tend to have must cycles up to three, maybe even six months. Whereas bulls that are only in their teens and 20s might have must cycles of only a few weeks. Now, what's interesting is the must cycle has nothing to do with the estrus cycle uh, of the females. The females go into estrus about every three months, regardless of whether the male is in must or not. And he won't mate with her whether she's in must and whether she's, she's in estrus, whether she's ovulating. So that's irrelevant. Uh, he goes into must usually in the rainy season. It's when there's a, there's a peak of food uh, and an abundance of food and he will just eat as much as he can and he's got all this muscle and energy and there's uh, tons of opportunity to mate there's all these young girls running around and he just goes crazy and he runs amok and he mates with the females and he's very dangerous at this time because he's got high levels of testosterone but that doesn't mean that he's an inherently a dangerous animal he's potentially dangerous you know you must have just much like a guy who's just gone out of a boxing match or a guy that's just played a rugby game, he's going to have high levels of aggression because that's just what he's been doing. Um, it doesn't mean that he's going to come after you and attack you. It just means that you need to be aware that that bull is a must and uh, you need to keep your distance. And um, I was in the Kruger National February last year and there was a bull and must in our vehicle, uh, not in our vehicle, about 20 meters away from my vehicle. And now all these guys who I'm assuming are for guys are qualified, are, you know, qualified nature guides, were all stopping up to take photos of this bull. And my vehicle was unfortunately the first vehicle in the queue. And I'm trying to reverse with a bull that's approaching me. He's in must. He's leaking down the sides of his face, which you can see he's got that temperin, which is exuding. And he's very aggressive. Um, and he's approaching my vehicle. And if I could just pull out of the situation, he'd probably leave me alone. But I've got 20 tour, tour guides behind me in their little in their cruisers, also all wanting to pull up close and take pictures. And of course, the, the guests want to take pictures of this wonderful big bull that's on the road. But the guides are, are being very irresponsible by not paying attention to the key signals. You walk in, you've got a bull that's clearly a must by exuding temperin down the sides of his face. He's got these leaky glands. His penis is hanging out. You can smell him from a distance. He smells, to be quite honest, like old, he smells like a brothel. They smell like sex. And um, <laughs> no, that's just what they smell like. They, they, they reek. And uh, they dribble semen and urine constantly. Uh, and he has a fully erect penis just dangling out. And he's got this swagger, like he's, like he's arrogant. And as a guard, you need to keep your distance from that. Yeah, as, as a guest, people need to see those signs a hell of a distance away. Um, that's obviously ignoring the, the issues with females. Females are a whole other kettle of fish. But with males, if you see a male must, you don't go closer than 100 meters to that bull. And um, we had this bull when I was in Kruger last year walk out onto the road. I had, I didn't know that he was in there because he, because I didn't have any notification. He just happened to wander onto the road. I was about 50 meters away and I tried to reverse back, but lo and behold, as I said, there were 20, 30 barred vehicles behind me blocking me in and they wouldn't reverse. So I had to do a U-turn quickly and get out of there in a different direction uh, because these idiot guides, and these are supposed to be professional guides, you know, that will, will endanger the elephant's well-being because they're chasing tips and chasing the dollar. And if the elephant charges a vehicle and flips a vehicle, that elephant will be shot. The, the guests might be injured, but that elephant will be shot and they'll, you know, it will be the guy's responsibility. Or when the, and if, if you are a tourist and you go in your own vehicle and your vehicle gets rolled, that will be the tourist's responsibility, but the elephant will still be shot. So, um, you know, it's up to us to really recognize um you know, our behavior on elephants. The same likewise, if you're with an elephant herd, you never, ever, ever cut a herd in half with females, whether it's she's got a young next to you or whether she doesn't have a young next to her. You never, ever cut a herd in half. If there's a herd passing through, you wait for that herd to clear completely. You don't drive into the middle of them unless they walk around you. If they walk around you, like they deliberately make a circle around you, it happens. You, you know, then they, they've made a choice to, 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 allow you to block them but you always stop about 50 to 100 meters back from elephants crossing the road allow them the opportunity never push an encounter never feel that they're there to entertain you as i said we have this very toxic mindset and we chase sightings and it's not fair on the animal much like it's not fair on any celebrity or sports person to get in their face and take 100 photos they get antagonized um are there any questions guys um nothing yeah 
Um, but yeah, um, going back into, so that's a little bit of guiding. I'm going to cover some more going forward about the other big five as well. And, uh, but what we need in South Africa is we need a hell of a lot more high felt reserves. I mean, that's something that is sorely missing in South Africa. Elephants live in grasslands very well. If you ever go out to Kenya or Uganda, you'll see that the, the, the elephants thrive in grasslands. And there tends to be this mindset in South Africa that grasslands are only good for, for small animals and uh, they don't, they're just good for farming. And I think that in South Africa, we, we would really benefit from having some, some high felt reserves with elephants contributing to grass cycles. And they've shown that elephants uh, in, in grass and habitats have an amazing interaction with, with, um, with uh, diversity and um, how they actually change the behavior of the habitats. A lot of small bird species nest specifically in the footprints of elephants. Um, so when you take out those large animals, they, they actually don't have breeding opportunities. Um, a lot of grasses re rely on, on heavy turnover in order to germinate. So and you're not getting that with zebras. You're not getting that soil turnover. You're getting just ground uh, grazing so you know elephants have have uh, a, an impact on ecology that we don't even realize and um the wonderful thing about elephants is that they really are generous they can fit anywhere in the world and um if if you look back even to nine thousand years ago there were elephants in every conceivable hab habitat on the planet with the exception of, of australia and antarctica but everywhere in the world nine thousand years ago there were different species of elephants there were mastodons in north and south america there were mammoths in europe and asia and um the last woolly mammoths went extinct three thousand years ago so and that was just that was during the time of the pyramids and that was in the northern that was in northern siberia um oh i've got a question from blessed um yeah um what do you do when a herd of elephants surrounds your vehicles uh, turn your vehicle off, tell everyone to be calm and to talk normally. Don't be quiet. That's what I find to be the best thing. Um, so blessed, if um, you're in a vehicle surrounded by elephants, turn your vehicle off. Often that rumbling of the engine is antagonizing because heavy rumbling for elephants is a sign of aggression. They'll rumble often when they're quite aggra aggravated. So if you turn your engine off, they'll calm down. Um Oh, what's the relevance if they walk in parallel to you, Willie? Uh, Willie, if they walk in parallel to you, it's obviously a sign of sizing each other up. You'll see these two bulls walking alongside each other, like two males posturing next to each other, sizing each other up, uh, acting like he's a big show. And usually the first one to walk away will be the one that's smaller. It's often what elephants, even out of must, will do. So if they're walking parallel to you, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge sign. So they are aggravated because basically i don't know if you've ever watched with inyalas they do the same thing they walk parallel to each other and they put in a bit of a show strutting off their muscles saying look how tough i am you think you can take me try me and so that's what that is by walking parallel with you they're just simply saying i can take you and the moment you back down that's the time that they of course they think they they are going to take you so you must never back down guys we've got less than a minute remaining um we're going to end it there, um, but we can. Uh, I'm going to start a. Um, you can ask me questions on WhatsApp as well, because you've got literally like 20 seconds left. So, um, and then next week Thursday, sorry, next week Wednesday, we can continue with elephants if people want with more technical information. Else, we can move across to some of the big five, the other big five members. Um, yeah, it was short and sweet tonight, only 40 minutes, but hopefully you learned something. All right. Yeah, and again, uh, you can WhatsApp me for more direct questions. Um, okay, we've got questions for more elephants. So maybe I'll continue with elephants next week with some more pictures. Um, all right, guys. Enjoy your evening. Auf Wiedersehen. Adios. Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay. Pleasure, huh?